From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's just the tip, Skurs, with Melissa Morgan. Anything you can do, I can do better. If you've got a tip for Melissa, a real ending to that happy ending, a repressed memory that might solve a mystery, how to get a giant red bow off of your brand new Lexus on Christmas morning without scratching the paint, <laughs> anything, tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837 or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. You just might hear your tip on the podcast. And now here's your host, Jack Frost nipped at her nose and now he's applying for permanent disability, Melissa Morgan. More cowbell. Jack Frost can always nip at my nose. I would never file charges. What's? It's like you don't know who I am anymore. Well, that's uh, upsetting. <laughs> it's not at all upsetting. I like the cold, you weirdo. You, yeah, well, okay. And what exactly does an ending for a happy ending mean? That's uh, bordering on sexual harassment No, in I, the workplace. I, oh, I hadn't even thought of it that way. <laughs> well, you ought to think about this shit before you say it. <laughs> You weirdo. God damn. Oh, dear. I might file charges against you. Oh, dear. I hadn't I don't know with way. who, but someone. Well, you know, I was just thinking about stories with happy endings that <laughs> may not really have... Oh, I, I, I thought you were talking about massages. I was, I was not thinking about... Mas- <laughs> Boy, this, is, this, this, tells, okay. this tells everybody in the audience the basic difference <laughs> between the way you think and the way I think. Melissa, <laughs> Melissa's always got her mind in the gutter. I'm a 12-year-old boy, always. and apparently you're a 74-year-old grandmother. Always. That's hilarious. You were thinking happy endings of stories, and I was, yes. th- I was like, why is he talking about, uh, you okay. know, I should have human said the trafficking real- and I poor sh- Asian women who are forced to... <laughs> Give handies to men I who... Sh- God damn it, Mark. I should have said the real <laughs> ending to that story with the happy ending. Okay, yeah. whatever. But I don't I even want to talk to you right I, now. Maybe I am your grandma. <laughs> you're someone's grandma. Maybe. I don't even want to... You're oh bad. Oh, my God. Bad well, man. I'm bad. You're bad. I'm not bad. Okay, you're not bad. All right. I'm bad. I'm bad, and I think what you say is bad, even though it's com- apparently really <laughs> innocent, and <laughs> and I don't know what happened. We were okay. off to such a good start. We that were. it just spiraled out into yeah. the old shitter. Oh, well. So As so often happens. Yeah, so often the happen. So um, I had a small... Uh, a uh, story to tell the tipsters this week um, involving uh, bodily fluids leaking out of my face. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so about a year ago, probably a little more than that now, I was trying to remember because I remember showing up to uh, Lee Moore's uh, tipster Lee's birthday party with a tampon in my nose. Um, and that was in May, I think. So I didn't have nose leads as a child. Apparently it's a very common thing when you're a kid, I have really shitty sinuses, which is in bad allergies, which is why I even started practicing yoga. Uh, holy crap, 20 years ago. Gosh, gonna be coming up. Hard on to t- believe. Huh? I know, 21 years. I've been teaching uh, yoga for 15. That's insane right now. Um, just because I have crappy allergies and sinuses. And uh, last year I had nosebleeds that were really scary. And they always happen late at night. Uh, <laughs> one, I was trapped downstairs and Mark was upstairs and I was, I just had to stand in the kitchen over the sink because we like, we use Viva paper towels and they are magnificent. They're like a, like a hotel bath towel. <laughs> They're so thick. I, that's why I love them. Like you can buy all of the, you know, angel soft sparkle bullshit paper towels you want and you use seven of them and you use one Viva for like a week. I mean, they're just, they're really amazing. Yeah, so I was, but they're so much more expensive. And worth every penny because you don't use as many. So uh, that's, there's a few things I um, will not um, bend on. Uh, sheets, really nice sheets because you spend a third of your life in bed and I, I like to be comfortable and not have pill balls scraping my flesh. 
uh, toilet and paper. I, and I love you for that. Yes. Uh, see, I, I introduced uh, producer Mark to really nice sheets uh, when we got together. And he was like, what the hell is this magic I haven't known about? This? Yeah, because I, I slept on the pill, the pill, the, <laughs> you know, the little pill uh, sheets. <laughs> <laughs> but but not only that, I slept on them for a long time and didn't wash them. For I don't a, want to hear about this anymore. Just, yeah, when I know, first met producer Mark, you had to uh, squeegee his sheets, and then when you would change them, they they cracked, and then you had to just crack them and take them off and try and they are like potato chips. You could just break them in half and yeah, throw them away. Yeah, that's so. Now we change the sheets quite often, and um, it's almost like it's. It's exciting and fun, like opening a new present. Like every every time we change the seats, we're like, oh, we're going to put these oh, on. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. We're so, we're really bizarre. But um, so sheets, uh, northern quilted plush t- toilet paper. I'm not wiping my ass with particle board. And paper towels. I spent a lot of money on, you know, shitty paper towels. And I'd use a roll in a day. I guess I'm real messy. But Viva makes these paper towels that are like... Uh, magnificent they're just so anyway i was trapped downstairs and i had run out of paper towels and i just had to stand uh, over the sink and bleed pr- profusely out my face so we have a we're, we're blessed with the, i may have told this story in the in the past episodes but we're blessed with uh, wonderful friends who are a, a, a wonderful friend who's a fireman and emt and we texted him and we're like what should we do because i assumed you put your head back And this one was bad. He's like, don't put your head back, put your head forward um, because you're going to swallow the blood and it's going to make you nauseous. And oh, was he right? Because it wasn't just blood. It was like giant clots. At that point last year, there was one the size of my palm. It was like I had delivered a child out of my... Okay, we're going (laughs) to... We should have a don't be eating dinner warning for okay, this episode. Okay, don't be eating dinner just at the beginning, just the next few minutes, and then it'll be over, and then everything's fine, and then we'll move on to killers, and you can eat anything you want then. So, uh, yeah, I passed a clot the size of, I, I was it was caught between my nose and my throat, and I didn't want to swallow it, so I hacked it out my mouth, coughed it out my mouth, and it was this, it landed in my hand, and it was the size of my palm. <laughs> so that was bad. Um, I went <sighs> to, I know, I'm sorry, I went to the urgent care The protocol is Afrin and tampons. I was real surprised to hear that. Um, Afrin is a nasal spray that I really like when I have sinus issues, and it, I guess, constricts the capillary, so you stop bleeding. I was was like, you're a doctor, and you're telling me my prescription is Afrin and tampons. Which is the name of a Marianne Faithful album from 1996. It should be, if it's not. It could be the title of my autobiography. (laughs) Afrin and Tampons, the Melissa Ann Morgan Humphrey story. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, it, I, and I found uh, accidentally, after all this had stopped, I found at CVS something called nosebleed plugs. Now, they're, you know, people are making fun of me because I posted a picture on Facebook and they're calling them nose tampons. And they're actually not. They're smaller. Um, and they are flat, like a surfboard. So they're not exactly comfortable because the nose is not flat. But they... You put that in, and and I ran through two, and they're ridiculously expensive, like ten dollars for two, and I ran through two quickly uh, on Friday, a couple days ago, and the difference is that I found some after I ran out of the nose plugs, and every CVS was out of the nose plugs. I of course had to revert to tampons, and I couldn't find the little like slender baby teenage girl ones i had to use like the medium ones and the thing is they do their job they expand <laughs> when you bleed on them so i'm sho- i'm shoving a tampon up my nostril and it's expanding and i'm like oh my god my face hurts so bad because it's blow it's blowing my nostril out because it's expanding so quickly because of the blood so all i had done is blow uh, blew my nose on friday morning before i went to get my roots did from the fabulous uh, tipster david who always makes my hair look exquisite and uh, so I show up at, you know, his his salon with the, th- this was the official nosebleed plug, not exactly a tampon, but because it didn't have the string or anything, but it's still uh, unattractive enough. So I had that in my face and I thought it was over because all I had done is I I blew my nose and it started bleeding, but not heavily. Well, Friday night, producer Mark and I are here at home. It's 10, 1030, you know, wrapping up the day. He's in his office. I bent over to pick up a lint ball and 
uh, the shit just starts flowing. And this time is big and bad. It was like the times, you know, several years, a year ago, whatever. So I'm standing over the sink because I can't quell the bleeding anymore. You know, producer Mark uh, texts our friend, the EMT, fireman, uh, tipster Jim. And it's like, look, let's just go over this again. What do we need to do? So pinch the bridge of your nose, um, a, a ice pack on the back of my neck, which we'd forgotten that part of the protocol. And don't swallow it. Lean over the sink if you have to. And I did. I had to sit on a stool and it just... It was bad, a lar- a large clots, not nearly as big as my palm, but as big as like like your middle finger, like as wide and as long as your middle finger. I'm flipping off flipping off my nose right now because it's bleeding. But th- knock wood, no, no blood yesterday. I'm going to go to another ENT this week. I'll see if I can find one. Because the first one I went to was recommended by a yoga student, and he, you know, is a fancy ENT in... Uh, uh, the San Fernando Valley. And I, I actually call them ENTs for ear, nose, and throat, but producer Mark has the official word. What's that? Otolaryngologist. Yeah, Gesundheit. So that's, yeah, the oto- You're welcome. otolaryngologist. So I went to him and he was like, you know, no bedside manner, like devil may care. And uh, he's like, oh, yeah, it's a vocabulary. We'll just cauterize it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So he numbs my nostril and the numbing stuff goes down my throat. And I'm leaning backward in a like a like a dentist chair, and uh, or an otolaryngologist chair, and I'm like I can't feel my throat. I feel like I'm going to choke. And he goes, Oh yeah, you, you feel that way, but it's not. You're not going to choke. I'm like, Well, that's helpful. Thanks, angel of death. As I'm like, because <gasps> my throat's numb, and I think I'm choking. So then he, you know, puts his, you know, soldering iron up my nostril. And I, you know, it's like smells like burning, whatever. And then I'm like, so that's, that's it. And he's like, oh yeah, you should be fine. You may have to have it done again, but probably not. Usually lasts, whatever. And I leave his office and I have a black ring around my right nostril on the outside where he has burnt my skin. Uh, Black ring around one nostril and a little bit of red where I guess maybe a, a little bit of a couple of blood drops or something. And I, I, so I look like a reverse coke head, like someone who snorts soot or something, not... You kind of look like the cover of that Marianne Faithful album. <laughs> Afrin and tampons? Yes, yes. That's the one nostril black. It was very attractive for she about a week. backed up by the band Lint Ball Nosebleed. <laughs> it, was very, it was very attractive and I was really pissed and I won't go back to him. So I will be finding a new N- ENT and I will have my shit cauterized, please... My beloved people stop messaging me on Facebook, then I'm dying and I need to go to, you know, have whatever. I'm fine. It's a fucking nosebleed. So there's that. And if so, if you ever have a real severe nosebleed, please just remember the prescription from Dr. Melissa. It's Afrin and tampons. So there's that, which was really a fun part of the part of the weekend. So this quote is from my beloved page a day calendar from Tipster Debbie that I got last year for 2019 and it's a quote from ted bundy we are serial killers we are your sons we are your husbands we are everywhere so i i just have to say that's a really awful quote and i have to mention that tipster tanya who we spoke with in february of this year she is at university in canada for criminology she uh, got a well-deserved A on her latest exam, and her theory was that Ted Bundy was not brilliant. He was average at best, and he certainly wasn't handsome. It's one of the things that made me start this podcast is hearing another remarkably, you know, mammothly successful podcast talk about how hot Ted Bundy was. And I was like thinking to myself, is there something wrong with me? Because he's not hot. He's really ugly. So Tipster Tanya wrote this amazing paper about how his eyes are too close together and he has a unibrow <laughs> and he his, you know, IQ level was not, you know, very high at all. He everyone was like, Oh, he's so brilliant. He's in a, he went to law school and he's an attorney. And even when he was being sentenced, this I didn't know. In in the paper, Tipster Tanya talks about the judge saying, take care of yourself, young man. Uh, you're very smart. It's such a waste of 
of your resources. I would have loved to have come up against you in court. And I'm thinking, what? The judge I, yes, said that? yes. Okay. I did not know this. Till oh, it, That's awful. Great. That's just absolutely after he after he was convicted. Yes. Of, yes. Of, of brutally murdering. Yeah, I think it was the sentencing hearing. People. Yes. Young women. Yes. The judge was like, "What a shame, young man. You you know your brain. I would have loved to have come up against you." And another thing about his, oh I know, God. I know. The, another thing about his brain is that you know they they did you know a autopsy, and his brain really wasn't any different than anyone else's. So there's all these theories that you know um, serial killers, you know, it's their uh, their limbic system is in constant you know pleasure seeking, or there's something very wrong with their amygdala, or they suffered. Lock, lack of oxygen either during birth or or b- b- in the first two years, you know, from like a drowning accident or something. I mean, there's lots of things saying that you know, brain chemistry or brain a brain trauma or brain damage could cause someone to be a serial. And I don't know. I don't know if I'm still you know. Obviously, I'm not a scientist, so my opinion is still out on that. But it's it's an interesting uh, thing. I actually have another. A quote from a, a Reddit, a Reddit um, poster who should, I think, be <laughs> like maybe she's my lost child, even though I didn't uh, remember having a kid. She says there are a lot of critics against IQ testing and what it actually means in terms of ability and understanding, and I don't think it's helpful or particularly enlightening to include that info when considering these cunts. That is very nice. It's a beautifully written, structured sentence. And I thought, yes, queen. I mean, I don't know who she is, but I love her. Uh, so speaking of a couple of queens, uh, shout out to Tipster Christina for solving the mystery of the uh, review from Mimi and Pa. Uh, she is indeed Mimi and Pa is not her husband. I mean, is her husband, not her daddy. So yeah, Mimi and Pa are a well, couple. I'm sure it depends on what time of the day <laughs> we're talking about she did not uh reveal their safe word and i'm totally fine with that totally fine with that so uh i got uh to formally be introduced to tipster jessica which we won't use her name as our safe word um as far as she knows uh tipster jessica and her sister sarah and um they're delightful uh on twitter and jessica actually tweeted this week Am I really going to sit here and watch a Christmas movie about a woman who falls in love with a Prohibition era ghost? Fuck yeah! <laughs> so, I love the Hallmark Channel. I love no, I, really Tipster Jessica. I think why didn't she didn't say it was Hallmark? She well, just said it was it a could, Christmas could movie. Could have been Lifetime. It I could guess. have been. I. What if it's Cinemax? Oh, maybe she subscribes to Cinemax. Is that to yeah. an old reference? Do they still exist? Oh yeah. Oh, they do. Okay. Oh yeah. I had a friend who, back in the old days, kiddies, back when you had to walk uphill both ways to school because uh, your horse was in the shop or whatever, um, I had a friend in college whose mother would not let her household subscribe to Cinemax because she thought it stood for Cinema X. Ah, well, there is Cinemax After Dark, so. Well, but that was before that, I think, existed. Oh, no, they've had that all along, I think. Oh, all right. You would know, wouldn't you, perv? Happy ending, hey, perv. Listen, I was a single guy for a I long time. I don't want to hear about anything else right now. Nothing else. Not a word. So this case is heartbreaking in so many ways, and yet it feels like maybe there is an answer that can be found, and that's that's hopeful. Um, the sources for this are numerous. A uh, really wonderful journalist named Katie O'Dowd uh, writes for the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, Ryan Miller from USA Today, uh, KCBS and KGO in San Francisco. Those news outlets covered it tremendously well. And there's even the the movie Milk, the Gus Van Sant film Milk that starred Sean Penn as Harvey Milk, um, talks about what happened. This was obviously in, in San Francisco, and it's an unsolved serial uh, killer case known as the Doodler. Now, it's... You know, I wish there was a better name, <laughs> but it's it was something that was pretty striking is that he was known to draw uh, his victims before he met them, um, maybe had sex with them and then killed them. He would sit in areas, bars, restaurants known uh, to be patronized 
by gay men, and he would draw someone, maybe someone who caught his fancy, and then meet them and and then kill them. So he has at least five murders attributed to him, but they feel he may have killed up to 14 men. And he also injured very badly three other men who survived. And the part that is heartbreaking is that the survivors refused to talk about it or uh, testify. Um, They would privately give a description of him, which is how we have a drawing, a sketch, and we have an age progression sketch that's available, which we will be putting on all of the social media outlets that we use. And it's very hard. It's very heartbreaking to think that someone wouldn't help stop a serial killer because they were afraid of their lifestyle being brought, you know, out in the open. Oh, I see. It's it's heartbreaking. Well, yeah. I, I assume that's because of the survivors is how we know that he sketched them. Yes, yeah. absolutely. They said the same thing. So between January 1974 and June of 1975, Five gay white men from San Francisco were killed, and their bodies were found around the Ocean Beach area of the city. Uh, Producer Mark is much more uh, well-versed in uh, San Francisco than I am. You actually lived in the Bay Area for a while, didn't you, Producer Mark? Yes, I I finished high school up there, and all my lifelong friends live up there, and uh, I also then moved back and lived there for a couple of years um, in my 20s. So are you familiar with Ocean Beach and Lincoln Park? Yeah, in, okay. Sa- in the San Francisco, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So they believe that this serial killer lived around the Bay Area, but not in San Francisco itself, and he would go to San Francisco on weekend nights to meet, unfortunately, to meet victims. So it's it's heartbreaking that he's this young, tall, lanky black man who was a very good artist by the accounts of the victims that survived who had this terrible MO of meeting men and killing them in just the worst. I mean, how, how can you say one way to kill someone is worse than another, but he would stab them in the front and stab them in the back and then slit their throats. It was the same MO every time there was one victim that was, um, it was more violent than the others because he, had many, many defensive wounds, and he really fought back. But so between January of 1974 and June of 1975, this 19 to 25-year-old, six-foot-tall, lanky, uh, medium-skinned black male um, would meet gay men um, in usually a diner uh, that was known in the Castro District district as a a place for – it was an open all-night diner – And like I said, three of the victims actually spoke to the police and gave them the same description. Two of those three victims who survived lived in the same apartment complex, which is very scary, wondering if he had stalked them there. Maybe he he lived there, right? He he may have, but they don't think he did. They believe that he lived outside of the city and commuted in during weekend nights. So he they don't think he lived in that, but it would make sense if, if you ascribe to that theory of the geographic profiling where someone is comfortable in a specific area. I think he was just comfortable in the Castro district because, you know, there were gay nightclubs and bars and he felt, you know, even at this time, we're still talking about, you know, uh, same sex relationships is, you know, it's illegal. I had no idea in 1970, oral sex was illegal? It still is in some states. <laughs> I don't, I'm like, uh, I, uh, yeah. So apparently I am just not really well versed in why these things would happen. But his first victim, and we actually have a, a clip to play explaining uh, what, the case was reopened in February of, of 2019. There's, you know, kind of a new sheriff in town. There's a new cold case investigator. And he's promising a lot of things. I'm not sure if he has the cards in his hand that 
and I don't know how to play poker, that one would need to like a full house or something. He he's holding them close to his vest, which I understand because the suspect is still alive. Yeah, he's probably around my age right now. Yeah, he's well, no, he's a little older. Uh, he's probably in his mid to late sixties, and they have an idea of who he is. They've spoken to him twice, but they don't. Oh, have... they have. Yep. Oh. Yep. So the first, and here's why I want you to hear his voice. And it's uh, producer Mark did a fantastic job of finding a much better recording because I was about to kick my own speakers from my computer down the hall because I was like, no one can even understand this. I did actually print out the transcript of the of the call because I thought it needed to be it needed to be heard clearly. But his first victim was Gerald Earl Cavanaugh. Now, he's a Canadian American immigrant, and they really do feel he was the first victim, even though they can tell you that he killed, you know, five men, but he probably killed more than that. They just haven't been connected to him. He was 49 and he was found fully clothed on January 24th of 1974. He was lying face up on Ocean Beach um, around 1.25 a.m. A phone call came in to dispatch. He had died just maybe a few hours before and it was determined that he was conscious at the time he was killed and he attempted to resist the killer because he had some self-defense wounds, but he, he, you know, obviously succumbed to his wounds pretty quickly. And he, because he was this Canadian American immigrant, he, you know, was single. He was, you know, didn't have a whole lot of details about his personal life, but he was the first victim. And producer Mark has a audio clip of potentially the killer calling into a to alert police that that his victim, he wants them to see his work. Can you play that clip, Producer Mark? Sure, and this is from a press conference from earlier this year, and after the, the clip you will hear the, uh, I guess it's the lead detective, talk about what else they're looking for as yes. well. On the 7th of January, 1974, at 1.25 a.m. Okay, I'm going to ask I believe there might be a dead person on the beach at, uh, right across from uh, Uloa Street, Aloha Street. Uh, if you follow the street right down to the water. I was walking along there and I saw somebody lying there, but I didn't want to get too close because, you know, you never know what could happen. Okay? Mm -hmm. Did you want to give me your name, sir? No, I don't think that's necessary. I just wanted to let somebody know. Maybe needs help or something. But, um, help is my duty to report it. Okay, fine. Let's check it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bye. So, before we answer questions, there's four things that we're looking for. There are four things that we want to seek today. The first is the $100,000 reward that we are offering for information leading to the identification and arrest of the individual responsible for these five homicides. In that reward bulletin, again, you see the original sketch provided by one of the assault victims and what would be a current picture of that individual today. The second thing we're looking for is identification of the individual who called in to police dispatch in 1974. If you are that individual or you know who that person is, to please let us know. The last bit of information we're going to provide that we'd like your assistance with is that we believe at the time of these homicides, there was a psychiatrist that was possibly treating the person of interest that we had identified back in 1976. We're unable to locate that individual, and all we know is that that psychiatrist likely worked in the East Bay and possibly had the last name of Priest. We've been unable to determine through records who that person is, and we're hoping that someone in the public may be able to provide information as to who the psychiatrist is with the last name of Priest and help us identify him so that we can interview him for information that may assist us in ultimately leading to the arrest of this suspect. So that's Detective McInern, who's in charge of, I guess, this maybe cold, new cold case uh, squad who's trying to solve this and they're 
actually they do have a DNA that was preserved. They're considering even using the familial DNA that, that helped catch Joseph James D'Angelo. But I think if you listen again to that recording, it's difficult for me to understand how you can figure someone's ethnicity from a phone call, because I couldn't tell you if that person who called in what their race or nationality was, the same way a lot of people think I'm a guy because of the way I sound. I'm just, maybe I'm just, I like to think I'm very auditory. I know I'm definitely not that visual, but what I can hear in that voice is his sing-song way of saying, at first he says, you know, I believe there might be a dead person on the beach. I thought I saw someone lying there. And then he says, and his voice actually goes up, but I didn't want to get too close to him because you never know what could happen. To to me, that is a huge red flag. Oh, yeah. I I, I agree with you. That's exactly what I was thinking, too. You could hear it's almost like, I don't want to say he's giggling under his breath. And and maybe, who knows, maybe this is just some sort of, um, you know, concerned citizen. It just doesn't sound like that to me. It just sounds too giddy or something. Yes. Yeah, it sounds too calm. And, And it didn't get giddy until... I didn't want to get too close. You never know what could happen. That yeah, just sounded yeah. mm-hmm, like I got a secret. That's what it sounds like to me. I just wanted to let someone know. You know, I felt it was my duty to report it. Maybe he needs help or something. It's it's a very it's very telling that they think that that phone call is the potential serial, and it was the first victim. And I think he just wanted someone he wanted someone to know so he could take credit i mean and i'm sure that you know in in 74 uh he's you know the the dispatcher is is t- probably typing furiously right to try and you know so they're going to take a pause i don't know if you've ever called in anything in uh, today but you know there's a lot of weird shit that goes on in california <laughs> um it when I, a lot of things happen to me when I'm driving, I see a lot of shit. Not, not that interesting, but interesting enough to report. Um, I was with my friend Barbara on a pretty major freeway, and someone was hauling a um, a wave runner, and it got loose from their trailer, or whatever they were hauling it with, and it uh, passed them, and it went it went uh, across four lanes, and oh my, into the into the uh, high speed uh, lane. <laughs> oh, into the diamond lane. Into the diamond lane. And it was like, what is that? What? It's a, it's a wave runner. It's on a hauler. And it's, uh, and the people in the trailer didn't know. And it was like, do, 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 do. Hey, is that my, it was like something out of, you know, um, National Lampoon's whatever. It, it, it just was hilarious. So we called, you know, 911. She, she was actually a 911 dispatcher. Barbara was in a previous uh, life. And so, she was like, call 911. And so I did and reported it to the highway patrol. And they pretty much asked for the results from my colonoscopy. I mean, they needed, you know, name, phone number, you know, why. So this guy looked out. Political affiliation. Yeah, yeah. Who do you vote for and why? And what's the last four digits of your social? And I mean, it was, well, you know. Well, they didn't really do that, did they? No. No. I'm hyperbolic. I tend to make things more dramatic. But I think because it was his first one, and I hate to say this because it may not have been his first one, he may have killed others that he didn't get credit for. And this may be the first one attributed to him because he called in. And then they started to tie things together. So his, uh, yeah, his second vi- victim, Joseph Stevens, is known as Jay, spelled J-A-E. He was a female impersonator and a comedian, and he was discovered on June 25th of 1974 by a woman walking her dog near Spreckles Lake. He was 27, and he had died just really shortly before he was found. Um, and o- uh, again, officers said that he was alive at the time, he had been seen alive at Spreckles Lake, which means he had either met someone there or had gotten there with the killer. The killer transported him or he transported himself and the killer or just himself and was waiting there. But he had been seen there alive before he had been found deceased. 
So his third victim was Klaus Christmann. He's a German-American immigrant, and he was discovered again by another woman walking her dog on July 7th. So just, you know, like a week and a half, not quite two weeks after Joseph Stevens is Klaus Christmann in July 7th of 1974. And his murder had been somewhat more violent. He had more stab wounds and his throat had been slashed several times, which the previous two, just one slice across the neck, um, no hesitation. And this one was a little more difficult. Maybe Klaus was a bigger um, you know, more able to to fight back, but he his his murder was was much more violent, and unlike the other the first two victims, he was married and had children, and this is the part that just you know <sighs> he was found with a small makeup tube on his body and his clothing. So they're thinking that he was a closeted gay man. So it doesn't say he was found with a makeup box and he drew giant eyebrows on himself and, you know, performed as Diana Ross. You know, a lot of men use weird... I actually, (laughs) when I managed a comedy club in Cincinnati, there was a a comic named Robbie who used something called Mantan. And he would uh, darken his, his face and neck. And a lot of times he would stupidly wear white shirts and his man tan would come off around the neck of his shirt. So, and he was just about as straight as one could be. So it does. I don't, and how would you know that? Cause he would hit on anything with a vertical slit. Yeah. Um, he was also not the smartest man. Um, <laughs> no, let me explain. I'm a, a boring straight laced woman who, who uh, manages a comedy club in a, you know, medium-sized town, Cincinnati. Uh, Not a lot of women in that business uh, at the time. And I didn't drink. You know, I was boring as shit. I was running a comedy club that, you know, sold alcohol and food, etc. You know, I had many people who worked for me who may have imbibed, and that was fine. I I do remember one time I was saging. I took some sage. (laughs) around uh the the club because it, we were having some trouble and i thought maybe it would help get out you know the previous demons the funny bone demons and um the funny bone is the name of the club i wasn't making like a it, it was go bananas and we had taken over a club called Fu- the funny bone and uh one of my waiters came up and put his hand on my arm and he goes melissa we're all worried about you and i'm like why he's like well there's like ashes in the ashtrays and are you smoking pot I'm like, it's sage, you fuck face. Tom, by the way, complete alcoholic. I used I used to find him in the walk-in freezer getting whippets off of the ready whip cans. <laughs> oh, he wasn't, he, he wasn't just an <laughs> alcoholic. He was a freak. They did everything. But back to Robbie. Uh, Robbie was a, a middle act, barely, at the comedy club. And uh, I get a call late one night. <laughs> You should explain the difference between a oh, middle sorry. act. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So there's an opener, the MC, the master of ceremonies. There's a middle act when you, you know, are too strong uh, to be an opener and people can't follow you, you move up, and then you become a headliner. And those are the big name acts that you hear. It's That's the old, kind of the old fashioned protocol for comedy clubs. So Robbie was barely a middle act, barely. And um, I get a call late one night at my apartment. I, you know, closed, closed up the club, whatever. It's one o'clock. I'd gotten home at two. And I get a phone call and it's Robbie. And he's like, Melissa, this is really embarrassing. Uh, but I bought some pot from your cook, Randy. And uh, I gave him the money and he didn't show up. He calls okay. me. So he's... You what really, am I supposed to do? Call the cops for you, he Robbie? He really is a Phi Beta Kappa. Oh, my God. <laughs> he wants me to intervene in his illegal, at the time, drug transaction with my fucking cook, Randy. That is... That is- just amazing yeah i I called the the um the booker and i'm like robbie's not no this is what and they're like we're so sorry i'm like yeah you are i don't care what people do in their private life but don't expect me to like i'm not your mom you know it's like mommy i paid randy and he didn't show up with my pot it's just (laughs) it's like that the there there was a story last year sometime i think about some some guy calling the cops because uh, his drug dealer welched on on the on, and, and he wanted the guy arrested for for, for fraud. fraud. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, that's kind of what uh, Robbie was doing, and that wasn't going to work. But so I don't believe that any every man who carries a small tube of makeup in their pocket is a closeted gay man. But I mean, it, it's fine. It, if he was, that's it doesn't matter. It doesn't it's not a good enough reason to kill him. It's there's no reason to kill him. So the the third or sorry, the fourth victim, Frederick Capen, was 32 and he was discovered on May 12th of 1975. So it's been almost a year since Klaus Christman had been found and he had been stabbed like the others in the front and the back and then many strikes to his aorta. But it appears that his body had been moved at least 20 feet because there were disturbances in the sand and he was finally identified through fingerprints um, he had been, those fingerprints had been, his fingerprints had been taken by the state because he was a nurse. And this is a man, you know, who was in the Navy and he had fought in Vietnam and he had earned medals and he lives through Vietnam. He's a nurse in Vietnam and he comes home and at the age of 32 is murdered by what I'm just going to diagnose as a self-hating gay black man. Um, you know, I'm again, I'm no doctor, but I just, that's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to live through a fucking horrible war and then you're murdered at home, you know, because you're a gay man and you think you've met someone, you know, that you can relate to. So the last known victim tied to the doodler is Harold Goldberg. Now he's different in that he's much older than the other victims. He was 66. He was a Swedish-American immigrant, and he was found on June 4th of 1975. And he had been there probably two weeks, which is, you know, almost two months after um, Frederick Capon. So he had been there for two weeks, and he was in Lincoln Park. A little bit different, not only just because of his age. His pants were unzipped. All the other men had been found fully clothed. And his underwear had been taken by the killer. And they're, they really are calling him the final victim of the doodler. But again, we're not really sure. So after three victims survived, that two had lived in the same apartment complex, they were described as a well-known entertainer, a diplomat, and a third victim. And they had all cooperated with the police during their interviews Um, and they had said, look, here's, this is what happened. He attacked me with a knife. Um, he was drawing me while I was sitting in the bar. We met, this is what happened. And they figure out a suspect, a young suspect, and they question him and they will never release his name (laughs) and they can't tie any of the murders to him definitively And the three victims who lived would not testify. They would... They they won't identify him. Nope. They they don't... I know. I know. You're talking about... I know. This is the part that breaks my heart, that there are three surviving victims, three surviving victims who are so afraid to come out as gay. Even today? Well, they may not be alive. I see. Just because he is, as you can tell, you know, age ranged from the 20s to the 60s. Um, so they may not be alive. I know that that the San Francisco police are in contact with some of the victims' families and keeping them updated, especially since this reopening in February of 2019 and this, you know, the police offering the $100,000 reward for information the release of the the audio, um, the release of this the age progression sketch, which I have to say, I, I don't, you know, I don't know how that's going to help that much to me, unless you're Frank Bender, who apparently is, you know, prescient or clairvoyant, you know, in the John List murder, down to the shape type of glasses he would wear forty years later. <laughs> I don't, I don't know that I put a whole lot of, I mean, you, you occasionally see those miracle stories where it's like, uh, this is a deceased victim and and they're decomposed, but if we recreate, and, and it really is artistry, recreate their facial shape, this is what they would look like. And, and, and it will be a, a really close, you know, resemblance. That's a little different than 
looking at a, you know, 40 year old sketch and saying, well, this is what he'd probably look like. It's like missing kids, the the age progression, the pictures on the milk carton. It's, I think it's helpful in some ways, but you never know in my mind what someone's going to look like. (laughs) So they have, now he has a shaved head. They've decided that he has a shaved head because he's in his sixties and you know, his lips are a little fuller and his face is a little, you know, softer. It's just, I don't, you know. What's really sad is that they know what their primary suspect looks like. Well, they know who he is. I'm just saying, but they, and they could put his picture up, but they can't do that. That's right. Yeah. Because that's what's really, boy, that's frustrating. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. So back to the fact that this happening in the seventies was a hindrance and not that gay rights are, you know, somehow when it comes to murder, I don't it's whether you're gay or straight or young or old or anything, it, it, there isn't a whole lot of um, help. If you're a, a, a young white girl, they'll probably work real hard to find where you are or how you died. But if you're a gay white man, or a gay black man, or a middle-aged or young man, gay or straight or whatever, you're not going to get a whole lot of help. But in the 70s, a gay white man being killed by a gay black man, yeah, nobody's going to work real hard. And I'm really hoping 2019 is, is a time that this can change. So this was a pretty huge deal in San Francisco in the 70s and another pretty huge deal in San Francisco in the 70s that I'd mentioned at the beginning is Harvey Milk. So Harvey Milk, if you want to know something, an interesting human's life, you should check into Harvey Milk. I mean, you don't have to agree with them. I didn't always agree with them. I mean, he was a Republican, which I, is that, um, it, now are they called log cabin Republicans, producer Mark? Is well, that... that's a group. That's a group of gay that's Republicans. That's an official group. Okay. I don't know if he was a log cabin member. I, I don't know if it was even a, a around in the 70s. I, I thought the log cabin Republicans yeah, I don't think it was. I'm started sure. later. Yeah, like the 80s or 90s. I think that was before his time. But he, you know, was a, um, a Korean War vet. He was um, a dive instructor. He was on a submarine when he got out of the military. He was a dive instructor. He was a small business owner in the Castro district. He owned a Castro camera. And a really fascinating piece of information, I never think about how do sections of town get their names, like Chinatown or Koreatown. or I just assume it's like, oh, someone moves there, settles there, and then lots of other people follow. So... Why was the Castro District known as kind of the gay area of San Francisco? It's because after World War II, a lot of men were discharged from the Navy and just stayed. A lot of gay men got out of the military and just ended up in San Francisco. It's like, well, I might as well just stay here. Yep, that's true. It's fascinating. I had no idea. And of course, the Castro District is named after Castro Street, which is the right. center of the of the district. Right. And Harvey Milk had, you know, he had, he was from New York, gets out of the military. Um, he was an actuary, and he was extremely successful. And but always kind of bucked the system. Older older actuaries were like, you know, this guy's a brash asshole, and he was. And like I said, I don't, you know, I don't, I didn't always agree with him. And he was, you know, I was a kid. And quite frankly, at the time of of his horrible assassination, I was much more fascinated by the Jonestown Massacre, which is sort of sad. But um, finding out about him has really been a great education for me. And um, about Dianne Feinstein. And I mean, it's it's kind of, it's not even kind of, it's a really interesting story. But at the time, Harvey Milk expressed empathy for the victims who refused to pl- to speak to the police. And he said, I understand their position. I respect the pressure that society has put on them, and I understand why they don't want to talk. And he said that they were, you know, the three men who wouldn't come forward, really. They probably feared damaging relationships with their family and their workplace. 
And he quoted the statistic, I don't know if it's true or not, but he said 20 to 25% of the gay men in San Francisco were closeted. Now in the 70s, that may be a very uh, astute um, percentage, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking um, to think that, but and it's, and it's so close in our history, but it's, it's probably very, very true that you were, you would be worried about ramifications. You know, Harvey Milk never came out to his mother before she died. And he didn't say he regretted that, but he did say that he hoped that something as big and bad as this would encourage people to open up to family and friends more if they were not, you know, open. Um, In the 70s, Cleve Jones, who was uh, an LGBTQ activist, you know, he remembers that in the 70s, everybody in the gay community was terrified. He said the media was reluctant to cover what was going on. And when the coverage did occur, it was kind of lurid and sensational and not very helpful. And Cleve Jones, who was an associate of Harvey Milk, said there were victims who surprised, who survived the attacks at the hands of the killer, but they were reluctant to come forward and cooperate. You have to understand that consenting sexual behavior between adults of the same gender was illegal and, in fact, a felony. That's true. A felony. I just am, I guess I'm still just a little bit blown away by that. So Harvey Milk was a city supervisor, and he won that seat in 1977. And he had run three previous times and had not been elected. But there was there was a change coming in the in the mid to late 70s in the San Francisco area, and especially in politics. The mayor was George Moscone, and there was another city supervisor named Dan White. And this is kind of um, confusing to some people. In San Francisco is both a county and a city it's the it's very unique it's it's the city and the county are the same thing there are no other cities in san francisco county other than the city of san francisco so they were technically county supervisors but as melissa says they really just represented the city oh that thank you i because i thought that they were city supervisors but yes i guess they were county supervisors also so on november 10th of 1978 Ten months after he was sworn in, Dan White resigned his position on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. He said that his salary of $9,600 was not enough to support his family. But a few days later, he requested that his resignation be withdrawn and that he be reinstated. And Mayor George Moscone initially agreed, but then he thought about it a little further and thought, you know what? I think I'm listening to a couple of other supervisors, and I think we're going to let your resignation stand. So on November 18th, the news broke about the Jonestown massacre. And Dan White was such a narcissist. He was like, you know, uh, one day I'm on the front page and the next day I'm swept right off. Well, Dan, you, you know, resigning as a supervisor in San Francisco's Board of Supervisors, not quite as big of a story as 900 people being forced to, you know, drink poison and dying. And a lot of them were actually from San Francisco. <laughs> you know, the cult had started in that city. So oh, the majority were from the Bay Area. Yeah, that's going to be a bigger story, Dan the Narcissist. So George Moscone had planned to announce White's replacement on November 27th of 1978 just a week and a half after the Guyana People's Temple. A half an hour before the press conference, Dan White somehow avoided metal detectors. Uh, He entered City Hall by climbing through a basement window. He went to George Moscone's office. Uh, Witnesses heard shouting, followed by gunshots. Dan White had shot George Moscone in the shoulder and the chest and twice in the head. He then walked quietly down the hall to his former office. He reloaded his revolver with hollow point bullets and he intercepted Harvey Milk. And he said, could you step inside this office for a minute? Diane Feinstein heard the gun- gunshots and called the police. And they then found Harvey Milk face down on the floor, shot five times, including twice in the head. And Diane Feinstein 
had a press conference later that day that said, today San Francisco has experienced a double tragedy of immense proportions. As the president of the Board of Supervisors, it's my duty to inform you that both Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed and that the suspect is Supervisor Dan White. Harvey Milk was 48 and George Moscone was 49. I remember listening to that press conference live. And when she says shot and killed, you hear you hear these audible gasps. I bet. From the from the audience and this this the thing that's and maybe you're going to talk about this the, the, the thing that's kind of sad ironic weird i don't know how you want to describe it but it was this event that really launched diane feinstein's political career because she was the president of the boards of supervisors and Moscone's assassination elevated her instantly to mayor and from there she ran from for the senate and i didn't it, know that yeah that really started her career wow i think the fact that she's the one that called the police is interesting and that's why i thought she was well known but i had no idea that it was that it actually put into place something that propelled her so within an hour dan white called his wife from a diner and she met him at a church and she was standing next to him when he turned himself in and there was a spontaneous candlelight march of forty thousand people that marched from castro street to city hall and their bodies, both of their bodies, were uh, laid in state at the rotunda, the City Hall rotunda. There were 6,000 mourners that attended the services. So Dan White served a little more than five years for a double homicide of George Moscone and Harvey Milk. On October 21st of 1985, a year and a half after his release from prison, he was found dead from carbon monoxide poisoning by running uh, the, a car in his now ex-wife's garage. He was 39 years old. His defense attorney said he was a very sick man. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a good way to put it. In the last year of his life, Harvey Milk emphasized that gay people should do more uh, to be visible and help end discrimination and violence against them, like serial killers like the doodler. And... He said, yeah, I have not come out to my mother. You know, she had died many years before. But I really urge other people to do so. I can't prevent anyone from getting angry or mad or frustrated. I can only hope that they'll turn that anger and frustration and madness into something more positive. So that two, three, four, five hundred people will step forward. Gay doctors, gay architects, gay lawyers, gay judges, gay bankers... I hope that every professional gay person will say enough and come forward and tell everybody, wear a sign if you have to, let the world know. Maybe that will help. So those are, Harvey Milk is a controversial character to me because he fought for rights for gay people. He was very um, theatrical, but he felt, you know, now is the time that I have to either put up or shut up. He, you know, was closeted for a, for a while in New York, but he finally found a place that he was comfortable enough to be who he was, and that was as a small business person in San Francisco and then running for office and being elected and using that platform to hopefully make changes. And in a terribly prophetic statement, you know, he once he got elected, of course, he received a lot of violent death threats. Um, You know, people around him were like, this is really raising, you know, you as a target for assassination. So he started recording his thoughts um, in case something happened to him and whoever succeeded him, he wanted them to know. And this is the one that just cracks my heart in half. He said, if a bullet should enter my brain, let that bullet destroy every closet door. So if you recognize the voice from that police phone call, if you recognize the sketch of the young man or an age-progressed sketch from today, if you know anything, if you hear anything, Please come forward. 
please contact the San Francisco police. And more cowbell. And if you think you can help, contact the San Francisco police at 415-575-4444 or text a tip to TIP411. If you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash just the tipsters.